majoring in this uh, convergence of disciplinary fields. And we're also in the process of developing a focus area in globalization studies at the master's degree level. So I would really like to thank all of the faculty and staff who worked so hard to make this program a reality. And I'd like to give a special mention to Professor Adrian Perez Melgosa, who really took this on and got this program approved through the SUNY system, which was not a simple matter. And to Professor Andrea Fetti, who's now serving as the GLI undergraduate program director. And I'd also like to, she's not on the panel, but she's in the audience, um, introduce you to Sophie Reynard Leroy, director of the GLI program out of the Institute for Globalization Studies. She's gotten us to where we are today with this launch with this career panel. And lastly, thank you, Hoden Hassan, for Assistant Dean of Advancement for putting this event together for us. Um, so now I'm going to introduce uh, several alumni of the Colleges of Arts and Sciences who graciously uh, agreed to join us today to share their expertise, their global contributions, and some of the challenges their own industries are facing, especially during these pandemic times. They will also tell us more about their own career trajectories, hopefully especially helpful for students who are in or considering this new BA program, as well as for those in our community who are interested in global studies careers or topics. Obviously, none of our panelists was a GLI major at Stony Brook, um, and I hope they will share with us through the course of our conversation why they would have found this major helpful in their career. So first, let me introduce Maureen Ahmed, who is a Foreign Affairs Officer for the U.S. Department of State. Ms. Ahmed joined the U.S. Department of State in 2016 as a U.S. Presidential Management Fellow. And in this role, she served as a political officer at the U.S. Embassy in Zagreb, where she received the department's Benjamin Franklin Award for Public Service. Ms. Ahmed graduated from Stony Brook with a Bachelor's of Science in Political Science and holds an MPA degree from the NYU Wagner School of Public Service. She also received the 40 Under 40 Award from Stony Brook University last year, so welcome. Um, and let me add that her areas of expertise, as you might have guessed from her job, are civil service and global health diplomacy. Next up, is uh, Stephen Galson, who's currently Senior Vice President of Global Regulatory Affairs and Strategy for Amgen. Uh, Dr. Galson spent more than 20 years in government service, serving as the Acting Surgeon General of the United States mm. and Director of the Food and Drug Administration Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. He also held senior level positions at the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Galson holds a BS in biochemistry from Stony Brook, an MD from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and an MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health. So welcome, Dr. Galson, and we're looking forward to hear about your expertise in public health and global regulatory affairs and biotech and pharma world. Thank you. Next is Ambassador Robert Gallucci, Distinguished Professor in the Practice of Diplomacy at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. Ambassador Gallucci previously served as Dean of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. He completed 21 years of government service in the US Department of State, serving numerous roles, including his last role as ambassador at large. Ambassador Gallucci has held teaching posts at Swarthmore College and Johns Hopkins University, and also served as president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. He holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Political Science from Stony Brook and a PhD degree from Brandeis University. Ambassador Gallucci's areas of expertise are public service diplomacy and academia. So welcome. And finally, our fourth panelist is Jay Corman, Managing Director of Avacent, a leading strategy consulting firm in government-driven industries. Mr. Corman has been published and quoted in numerous national and trade publications, including the Washington Post and Defense News. He has appeared on PBS Nightly Business Report and Reuters TV for comment on defense mergers and acquisitions. Prior to joining Avacent, Mr. Corman served as a congressional fellow on the personal staff of a member of the U.S. Armed Services Committee, and he also holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Stony Brook. Mr. Corman's areas of expertise are global technology consulting, including defense systems, health, energy, IT, and technical services. So welcome. Now I'd like to begin the program 
and I'm going to lead off with the questions um, that I'd like each of our panelists to answer in turn. Um, and I think I will start with Ms. Ahmed. And please tell us, oh, before I do that, and if you have questions, I think you've already figured it out, submit them through the chat box and we'll try to answer them after we get through sort of the lead-in questions for the panelists. So with that, Ms. Ahmed, what does a career in international affairs look like? Could you share a little bit about your career journey and how did you get into your field? And why are you still there? So. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. And thank you to this Journey Brook University for inviting me. This is really exciting. I also am looking forward to hearing from the other panelists as well. Um, I was just thinking this would have been great to have if I was still a student um, at Stony Brook, which uh, I graduated in 2011. So I'm just super excited to hear that this program is coming to uh, Stony Brook. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm a current foreign affairs officer at the State Department. Uh, that means I'm in the civil service. Um, I have colleagues who are in the foreign service. Um, so in, in relation to that, I stay in DC. I work on our issues at the State Department um, here in Washington, DC, and work alongside our colleagues who are foreign service officers around the world. Um, and I currently work at our Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, which is broadly known as PEPFAR, the program uh, that works on HIV and working to combat HIV around the world. PEPFAR stands for the President's Emergency uh, Plan for AIDS Relief. Uh, I joined the State Department uh, through this fellowship program called the U.S. Presidential Management Fellowship. It is a fellowship that um, you get to uh, you know, um, apply to if you're in graduate school and you go through this intensive process uh, to work in the government. So I, as someone who's always been interested in international affairs and public service, uh, decided that government was where I wanted to go after grad school. So I applied to the fellowship, got in, and I knew I wanted to work at the State Department, especially the State Department, because as someone who comes from New York, I grew up in Queens, um, you know, the first, uh, the first, uh, I guess exposure to international affairs was just like taking the seven train every day and going through all the different neighborhoods, seeing the UN from my from my building and realizing that I'm, you know, this one person in this global, global atmosphere around me. So I've always had an interest in international affairs. So I knew that joining the government meant working with, you know, colleagues around the world and working to make a difference on a global platform. Um, a little bit what I do currently, I, at the PEPFAR program, I work on our South Africa portfolio. Uh, South Africa currently has the highest HIV epidemic around the world. It has approximately 7.5 million people who have HIV. So I've been working on this program uh, for our office for the last two and a half years. I, um, you know, got this opportunity through the fellowship. And during this fellowship, I also had the opportunity to do two rotations, um, which is a way for us to learn more about the department. And so with that opportunity, I decided I wanted to go abroad. I wanted to see what we're doing um, at our embassy missions overseas. So I had the great privilege to join our US embassy in Pretoria in South Africa for six months, where I served as the acting deputy coordinator of our PEPFAR program. So I was working at the embassy in Pretoria working day in and day out to uh, work on their HIV program there. And this was um, 2017 to 2018. And that was an incredible experience because I got to work with our colleagues uh, across the US government, which includes colleagues from the State Department, from CDC, USAID, the Peace Corps, working with them day in and day out uh, to see how we can work with our um, bilateral partnership with the South African government to make an impact on HIV. Um, when I returned back from that rotation, I was given a great opportunity in my office to then manage the South Africa portfolio on behalf of our office. Uh, so I work closely with our ambassador and I work closely with our uh, assistant deputy secretary to manage this program. And, you know, the last two years on the DC side of things has been, uh, you know, pretty much living in the sky, I would say. I've done about, you know, I would say seven or eight trips in the last two years alone to South Africa, every couple of months, going back into country, going back into the embassy, working with our colleagues there, checking out health clinics, um, troubleshooting on issues that come up uh, across our portfolio overseas. So uh, the last two years, even though I'm not a foreign service officer who lives and works overseas, 
pretty much have been, you know, paying rent in DC for my apartment, but never really been there. Um, every time uh, I come back, my friends and my family, even my mom asked, you know, where are you today? Are you in South Africa? Or are you in DC over there? So it has been a very interesting and exciting um, journey so far. And as you can um, guess, right now, it's been uh, a very daunting time because not only are we working on the South Africa HIV epidemic, but we're working on dual pandemics right now. You know, the COVID-19 has had a great impact not only here in the United States, but around the world. And especially in South Africa, which currently has um, one of the biggest COVID breaks, outbreaks in, in the African continent. So it has been um, a, an incredible challenge to be working on both pandemics um, and trying to make an impact. But well, we've done some great work, which I can talk about later, on how we can sustain the gains we've made so far with our HIV work, but also uh, ensure that COVID-19 doesn't, you know, um, impact uh, the, the treatment services that we're providing. Um, just really quickly before that, I was in grad school. So I, you know, right after grad school, I got into the fellowship. I took one suitcase from Queens, New York, came to DC, was waiting for my clearance and didn't realize that you have to wait for your clearance before you can start. So uh, the summer before I started uh, uh, working at the State Department, I, you know, enjoyed my first break, uh, was watching friends on TV every day, but also, you know, acclimating myself to Washington, DC. Um, and, you know, uh, prior to that, while I was in grad school at NYU, I also worked at the UN. So that's one of the ways I got into this field. I decided to take my background, which is in gender equality and women's rights and human rights issues to the UN, where I worked as an intern um, at UNDP on the gender equality team for a couple of months. And then I joined UNFPA. So it's a lot of acronyms, but um, UNFPA is the Family Planning um, Association of the, the UN um, entities. And so, I started working on family planning issues in Uganda and South Africa, and so that's where I got my um, background in Sub-Saharan Africa issues. Uh, while I was also in grad school, I also worked at an NGO um, to work on child marriage issues as well, and that was an issue dear and close to my heart because back at Stony Brook, as I was a political science and women and gender studies major, I, I worked focused on female genital circumcision and child marriage. So it was a great opportunity to take the background that I got from Stony Brook and apply it to working on the issue on the ground. So grad school was busy. Um, and before that, I'm trying to go backwards. <laughs> before that, you no, know, let me, I, let me just, can we maybe one minute uh, to wrap it up? Because yeah. I want to hear from the other panelists. As well. Yeah, sure. Um, just before that, you know, I was working on local issues in New York City and uh, to, you know, to go back to that at Stony Brook, that's where the foundation started, you know, taking all these courses at Stony Brook and understanding how to, uh, you know, make an impact on these issues. I, I really credit Stony Brook and my time there to, you know, build that foundation. So, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. I didn't want to cut you off, but I do want to give the other panelists just a tiny bit of time. Um, so maybe now... Uh, turn it over to Dr. Galson, because you can give us some perspective uh, compared to where Ms. Ahmed is starting on your career in international affairs, which is a little more on the biopharmaceutical and regulatory side. Sure. Well, first, let me also say how pleased I am to be with you all. I've had a long relationship with Stony Brook. I graduated in 1983, so I have a lot of career under my belt and it's challenging to uh, boil it down like this but I'm going to do it because I want to hear from the other people as well. So I think the first thing I would say is that every single career is different. There, no, there is no right path and even seeing this group of people and how their careers have developed in completely different ways is a, is a really strong example of how you can get into this field from many different directions and take many different paths when you're there. After medical school, I trained in internal medicine and I learned in that internal medicine training that we were putting huge number of resources in for a particular patient in the intensive care unit who was smoking, for example, and then they would leave and smoke again and be back in. And so I decided somewhere in those three years that I was really interested in public health, what I could do to impact the health of more people. So when I finished, I went straight into the US public 
Health Service uh, and worked at the Centers for Disease Control, which everyone is familiar with considering what's going on in the world right now. And I had several different roles in uh, environmental protection, in energy, which is the part I was working in was radiation uh, issues, radiation protection and environmental health issues around uh, factories that are contaminated with radiation. I worked um, in drug regulation, as you've heard, and in uh, occupational health. I traveled around the country trying to assess the hazards that workers were exposed to. And I think each one of those, I had a, a lot of interest and enthusiasm with, but after a few years, I became interested in something else. So there's some people who do the same thing for 20, 30, 40 years. I'm not, I've never been one of those people. And I tended to pursue things until I mastered them and then wanted to move on. Um, towards the end of my career, I had what I thought would be my last professional experience, which was, um, leading a huge part of the Food and Drug Administration that manages drugs. And that was going very well, quite challenging. And then I got a call at the end of the Bush administration to see whether I wanted to be the Surgeon General. And even though I was in a great job, I thought, well, how many more opportunities am I going to have to be the Surgeon General of the United States? So I jumped on it. That was a fantastic experience. Uh, bled over to the Obama administration for quite a few months, was very involved in the last influenza epidemic in 2009. And uh, when I left the government, I felt very, very satisfied that I'd had a huge impact for many millions of people. And uh, so I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I realized very quickly that I missed the teamwork uh, of the work that I was doing in government. So I decided to make a try in private industry. And I'm, I'm working now in a position that uh, really builds on almost everything that I've done as I interact uh, with government officials in 100 countries around the world and help to get uh, innovative medical products out into the world to help people's lives be prolonged and uh, to prevent death when that's even possible. So um, it's been a very interesting journey, but don't try to follow me. Um, choose your own path. <laughs> Thanks. Very, very good. Thank you. Um, let me now turn it over to Mr. Corman. You know, what did your career journey look like and um, how did you get there? Sure, and thank you uh, also. It's uh, a pleasure to give a small thing back to a university that has done so much for me. So I can keep my conversation to just a few minutes because unlike I think many of my colleagues uh, on this panel, they've all had interesting job after interesting job. Pretty much when you boil it down, I've had one job since Stony Brook and not quite, but it, it sort of uh, feels that way. I'll start with saying uh, to the point Stephen made on, you know, there's no set path. I never had a dream to be a technology consultant, you know. Uh, I also grew up where Maureen did in Queens, and I don't think I knew that consulting existed as a profession. So uh, I certainly never stayed up at night thinking of a grand plan to become a consultant. I basically, you know, when all said and done, I fell into this. And uh, really, it's, it's sort of the start at Stony Brook that kind of got me down this path. So I'll describe that. Um, what I'll say is I knew kind of the liberal arts were kind of in my um, future because I just was not a, uh, I wasn't strong on, on the sciences. So where the, the kind of interest came in, again, kind of like Maureen growing up in New York, uh, the multicultural kind of diversity of my neighborhood. But I also had the, the fact was my mom uh, was born in Yemen of all places. And so she grew up actually escaping with her family during one of their many civil wars, unfortunately. Uh, and ultimately through this roundabout means, met my father who was a Brooklyn born kind of kid and uh, they settled in, in New York. And so just having that in the background, I think sparked an interest. And I certainly, I recall in high school going to libraries to learn more about what sparked that crisis and you know, um, sort of who are the actors and why am I kind of in New York when I probably could have been thousands of miles away. And so that certainly shaped, I think, my upbringing. 
And when I found out I could actually major in something that, uh, you know, uh, that could teach me about international relations, I jumped at it. And so I was also a poli sci major uh, and, and, you know, became a part of the political science honor society at Stony Brook, really embraced kind of that, that, um, that the major basically. Um, what I'll say is one of the twists of fate that I think put me to the path you know, wh where I am now very much occurred at Stony Brook. And it was probably about three weeks prior to my graduation. I, there was a professor that I just adored and uh, I was a TA for one of his classes. And three weeks before graduating, he said, you know, Jay, what are you planning to do after school? And uh, again, like Maureen, I kind of thought my options were I could stay in New York, apply my poli sci degree there, or maybe go to DC and I could work for the federal government or a think tank or you know, some kind of related institution. And um, you know, the, the professor heard me out and what I had in my back pocket at the time was an unpaid internship at an arms control think tank in DC. And I knew that I had pretty much three months to make it. You know, if I couldn't transition that to a full-time job, I'd be back in New York with no plan B. So this professor, I think, took pity on me and pulled a business card out of his uh, Rolodex and said, here's somebody I met, I don't know, it was a year ago at a, th at a conference maybe in Canada at the time. And he said, once you settle in DC, why don't you give this person a call and see if that person could have a full-time job? They were, that, that person was the president of uh, an, another think tank uh, here in DC. And so after kind of settling in, um, I ended up applying to that, to that think tank, getting the job. And this is kind of a roundabout way of describing this, but he was the president of the firm. I found out that the chairman of that firm uh, had a sort of a, a for-profit consultancy on the side. And so after one year, after a year stint at the think tank, the, the chairman of the company invited me to uh, join this defense consultancy. And 25 years later, through this roundabout way, that became Avicent, the firm that, I'm, uh, that I co-lead today. So kind of fortunate, it really was the Stony Brook experience that kind of put me on that path. Thank you yeah. for sharing. Yeah. And uh, to our fourth panelist, Ambassador Gallucci, would you like to please share with us what does a career in international affairs look like and what was the journey like? Sure. So. I congratulate you, Nicole, and, and Stony Brook on the new uh, degree. Uh, I was at Stony Brook a long time ago. I started almost 60 years ago. And if the degree was available then, Nicole, I think I would have tried to become a major and take that degree. Um, I I come grew back. Up, pardon? <laughs> come back. Come back. <laughs> I, I, I grew up uh, not far from Stony Brook and on uh, South Shore of Long Island in Brentwood. So Stony Brook was my local university. And you all should know that uh, when I started at Stony Brook in 1963, the undergraduate population was less than a thousand. And when I graduated, it was, a, it was about 1100. Uh, and that, that was it. So it was like a small college uh, at that time. Uh, my journey was, as you have now figured out, if you couldn't before a long one, but it, it wasn't a very meandering one, uh, Nicole. It was pretty straightforward. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, my brother, who also graduated from Stony Brook uh, before I started, uh, he was a physics major, gave me a, a book by Robert D. Murphy, and the title was Diplomat Among Warriors. And it was a biography of a foreign service officer who served during the Second World War in North Africa. That was the beginning and almost the end of the story for me. I, uh, when I got to Stony Brook, I was smitten by international relations. The chairman uh, of the political science department was Martin Travis. Uh, he taught me about realism and international affairs. Uh, I focused as much as I could with the courses available. I, I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up and it was I wanted to be a college professor. I went and got a PhD at Brandeis. Uh, I was still focused on international affairs. And I was also, I should say, own up to this, that I was focused on conflict. I was focused on war. And I would say particularly nuclear war. And so uh, I wrote a thesis on the Vietnam War and I did a postdoc, wrote a book. 
and I was headed uh, to teach. I was teaching at Swarthmore, uh, Johns Hopkins. And then I got seduced by the policy community, by Washington, D.C., I would say. So I thought I'd go into the State Department just for a little while to see what policymaking was like in international affairs. And I stayed for about 21 years, uh, and it was quite a ride for me. Uh, it was, it was, I would say one of the things, points I'd like to make for particularly students is I was stunned by the responsibility young officers in the Department of State and even in the political military area, national security area, the responsibility one is asked to take on. I went in when I was 28 and was overwhelmed by being asked to write the talking points for negotiators that were in Geneva doing arms control. I couldn't believe that's what I should be doing at, at that point. I should not be touching sharp instruments. I, I, I was um, smitten by policymaking. Uh, and so the career meandered around within the Department of State and a little bit with the United Nations and a little bit with another international peacekeeping organization but always on assignment from the US government. Uh, and I never um, missed, I didn't think my academic life so much, but after 21 years, uh, I decided I'd try to recapture it. And I went back, staying in international affairs, I went back uh, to academia as a Dean of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Uh, and that was uh, like moving from being shortstop for the New York Yankees to being coach of the team. And I enjoyed coaching uh, students. And while I had some time away at the MacArthur Foundation, I, I came back and for the last six years, I've been teaching at Georgetown. Now I'm teaching this semester graduate students in international affairs. So as I said, a, a long journey over a long time, but it was pretty focused on, on uh, national security policy, political military affairs, uh, scholarship and teaching, and a lot of policy making. So thank you. Thank you. Let me ask a follow-up question of Mr. Corman. Um, in your field, your industry, which is really one of consulting, so I think students should learn a little bit more about that. It sounds like it was mysterious to you when, when mm -hmm. you started out. Um, how is that type of industry making a difference in the world? And you know, what are, maybe let me combine it with a second question. You know, what are some of the big challenges that your industry is tackling? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it's a tough question for me because the type of consultancy we do, it's geared toward kind of big business in fields that don't have a lot of what I'll say do-goodery to it. So we do have clients in aerospace and defense. We have clients in oil and gas. You know, those aren't sort of industries that I think young people just grab a hold of and are just very interested in careers there. Um, you know, there's somewhat of a negative connotation, I think, to, to a lot of those firms. Now, we also do work for healthcare firms and others, so I don't want to make it sound like we just work for an evil empire. But I did a panel um, several years ago, not too dissimilar from the people around, uh, you know, on this panel, where, you know, the, the jobs that people pursue are very noble. You know, and so I was on the, the panel that I'm thinking of. There was somebody who, um, you know, essentially did climate change advocacy. Another did kind of uh, providing sanitate, like basic sanitation to underdeveloped areas. You know, you can't get better than that. With me, you know, I was asked at that panel, you know, so what did you do in the past year that you're particularly proud of? And I thought, oh, you know, I spent probably most of my time working with a $35 billion defense contractor to help them acquire a rival on the cheap that's going to eliminate competition. And, you know, there, was, there wasn't a lot of, uh, of, of um, sort of national, you know, um, kind of benefit to it. But what I will say is, you know, with, with the type of consulting we do, um, if I just stopped there, I think I'd do a disservice to the firm because we do quite a bit in the healthcare domain. We do a lot in technology consulting that kind of spreads technology to, to the global um, sort of market. Um, but, you know, one, anec one anecdote of a project that we did recently that I'm particularly proud of is, is we worked with a national government that was looking at an investment in a cell therapy center of excellence. And their question to us was, 
you know, how much do we invest in this facility? What kind of services do we offer? Is it patient facing? Is it, is it just a research lab? And we did all sorts of analysis to help them find the right partners, establish the right services. And, you know, some of the cell therapy applications, it was for cancer and diabetes and, you know, solving these real national health problems that this country, that this country faced. So that type of consulting, it was easy for me to, you know, be, be very proud of that kind of work, even if, you know, a, a good sort of amount of work I do is unapologetically helping businesses make better decision uh, decisions. And that's what the business consulting um, that we tend to do focuses on. Uh, so, so, you know, um, from, from the standpoint of getting into the space and, and um, um, kind of why that was attractive, even with the political science background I had, a lot of the work we did uh, in the early days of the firm was centered around kind of policy and technology decided on by the U.S. government. And so just as a sponsor for NASA and uh, the defense budget, and you know, the federal government is involved, is involved in so many different aspects of technology that I first became uh, involved in the kind of policy and regulatory aspects of that technology that then developed into kind of more business decision making consulting. So in a nutshell, I describe it that way. Thank you. So let's turn to, actually, um, thanks. Uh, turn to Ambassador Gallucci and maybe change the question a little bit to say, you know, how does what Mr. Corman is doing in a management consulting firm helping large corporations play into the policy making, for example, nuclear disarmament that you were um, speaking to? As it turns out, uh, if you're in the business of um, national security, uh, you're in the consultant business, you're in that world, and a, a very often the expertise uh, that you look for uh, comes from outside government. And, uh, they are, there are people in the NGO community to begin with uh, who have worked in government or some who have come directly from academia, and they provide the expertise that we need when we do negotiations. Similarly, there are um, literally, uh, they, they, I, I know that my colleague will not be offended to know that uh, since I heard a DC reference, that there are references to Beltway bandits, uh, but I never considered them bandits. I <laughs> considered them allies. Um, let me give you maybe one thing, that would be a word of substance here. If one's involved in national security and political military issues, and you're on the peace side of these things, and you're looking to do arms control because you're in the State Department, you're looking to manage the huge strategic nuclear weapons uh, capability that the United States has and make sure uh, that we don't end up using them, uh, but we end up having them and contribute, have them contribute to our security. That turns out to be an enormously technical driven enterprise, arms control. And I don't believe it could be pursued by us who are professionals within government without the professionals outside of government who provided the information, the data, and an analytical approach to what makes for stability between states that have a lot of these weapons. So I, I think there was a reliance on the outside community to improve the quality of public policy, certainly on the technical side. I, one more word is to say that a lot of what I did was not technical, though it was peacekeeping and it was in the field and on the ground. And as in a different sort of way, it, it's not technical, but again, we're looking for expertise, which we might not have in government. And where you go to is you go to the private sector and you go to non-governmental organizations and you go to academia. And all these folks are contributing to an environment that is hopefully improved for success on the ground. So I, I, I think everyone has to understand that when you're in government, you rely on a lot of people who aren't in government. Thank you. So let me then turn to Dr. Galson, who's um, has maybe a different uh, tack on this question. You know, what are some of the ways people in your field or industry, and you've had several, we've already heard, are making a difference in the world? And what are the grand challenges at the moment? you think? Great. Yeah, 
I, perhaps I have the easiest task in answering this. Uh, from a, in public health, the, the ways that people are making a difference are, are enormous and important to every single person in the world. And of course, now uh, we're in the spotlight for managing COVID. Uh, but at other points in my career, just to use some examples, I've worked on reducing childhood mortality, decreasing hunger, improving access to medical care, reducing maternal mortality, HIV prevention, um, uh, many occupational hazards, improving air and water quality, early detection of cancer. So these are things that almost everyone, probably everyone who just listened to that list can see what an impact you can make working in public health, either from a policy perspective or working on the ground in public health programs like some of the ones that Maureen is working on. In the area of medical products, where what I'm doing now, it's a little bit simpler to describe. It's to reduce illness and death from uh, diseases that, that are treatable. And uh, everyone here knows of someone, either in their family or friends, who've had a disease that they've had to take a medicine for. So it's always been very easy for me to see the real life examples in, in life and death and people's lives that result from some of the work that I do. And uh, I've never had a moment of uh, not feeling very, very gratified by, by making a difference. Um, I would say the big challenges are really, really big. So look at COVID today. Um, we've got our public health agencies who are in conflict with the executive branch, even though they're part of the executive branch, in terms of the, the messages that are being conveyed to Americans and to people around the world. If that isn't a grand challenge, I don't know what is. Uh, we need to figure out a better way to, when there is a public health emergency, help people understand what to do and then provide the tools that are necessary to get the job done. Uh, in the medical product area, there's a particular concern, and I know you've all heard about drug prices, but an angle to that is how to continue to fund innovation while also keeping a lid on prices. We have an amazing scientific establishment in the United States where leaders around the world in uh, developing new path-baking drugs based on new genetic and other uh, information coming out of basic science. We don't have a work of working model to pay for those products and continue to fund the research. It's going to become harder and harder in the future. So those are um, some of the grand challenges that I think uh, people coming into this program could maybe help us with in the future. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ahmed, I'm going to change my question up on you because in your introduction, I think you alluded to many of the grand challenges and we heard a lot about PEPFAR, for example, and HIV. So what is the one piece of practical advice you would give to someone starting? And I'm going to lead off with you because you're our most recent graduate. So either the one thing that you're really glad you did or the one thing you wished you did, whichever <laughs> you would share. Sure. Well, I have wrote, written down five um, <laughs> advice that I wanted to share, but I'm going to stick to one, which I think is critical, and I'll give some background, and that's, that's to travel. Um, you know, I'll be very frank to say I did not come from a family where we could afford to travel. I mean, I didn't travel overseas until maybe, you know, I was 17. Um, but one thing I found really quickly was that there are multiple avenues, resources, scholarships around me that you can take advantage. And I think the one thing I did right at Stony Brook was make the time to go study abroad. And I, you know, found an opportunity in front of me. I came from a background where my parents were, you know, really afraid of me going, you know, to a different borough, let alone to a different country. But I found a way to make the case to say, the career path that I want to pursue will require me to understand what's happening to people on the ground. And I knew that studying abroad was going to widen my exposure um, to not only different cultures, but different perspectives. So I, 
had the privilege to study abroad my last semester in Florence, Italy. And while, you know, I can look back to that time and think about all the great gelato that I ate and all the great photos that I got to take and put on now what we say is Instagram. Um, the best thing I did was, you know, save up money, go to different countries um, and see things on the ground. Uh, you know, one of the things I wish I had done is look out for scholarship opportunities that help students go study abroad. There's some great opportunities, one that's um, sponsored by the State Department, the Gilman um, Scholarship, that if you just take some time to write a, an essay instead of going to party on a Thursday night, you can have the potential to being fully funded to go study abroad. Um, not enough American students go study abroad, and I don't even necessarily think you need to pursue a career in international relations to go um, to go study abroad. I think anyone should take that advantage while you're an undergrad. It's just the best time you can do it. Um, so I would really say travel as much as you can. There are multiple ways you can do that. You know, I gave up coffee and other uh, splurge items just so that I can save up money every year uh, to go travel overseas. I look out for budget uh, deals whenever I can to get that flight. Of course, I'm not traveling right now, so I will say that, uh, but I already have that money saved. So hopefully when this uh, pandemic is over, um, I'll have the opportunity to go back out there. And every time I go back out there, it grounds me to the work that I'm doing at the State Department, but also gives me a, a wider perspective. It just ensures that you put yourself um, in perspective as to what's going on around you, and then you can see uh, you know, what you can make the impact. So I, I would say study abroad, travel, find free scholarships, uh, find free programs, um, and, and, and do that research. So yeah. Great. So let me ask two follow-up questions to you. Um, Italy was your first travel abroad. Do you speak Italian? So uh, I will say that I took a course there, uh, but Florence, uh, as beautiful as a city as it is, everyone spoke English there. I mean, it's the second uh, destination for American students. So I do look back and regret not practicing it more. Uh, if it comes back up, I can recognize it. So again, I think one of the advice I would say now is that if you do get the opportunity to study a language, stick to it. Because uh, if, if you don't get to practice, it's going to be gone. Uh, but yeah, I did learn it then. <laughs> <laughs> Immersion. All right. Let me ask you a question that came in from uh, our audience. What advice, and this is a follow-up to what you were just talking about, this is specific advice on applying for the graduate, um, for graduate students applying to the Presidential Management Fellowship. So is there any specific advice there? Sure. Uh, so that program is for students uh, who are graduate, current graduate students or recent graduate students. So, you know, when that opportunity comes your way, uh, that fellowship process is, you know, it has multi-steps. Multi but I think the best way to prepare for that, especially as students who are going to be pursuing a Bachelor of Arts degree is, you know, even if you can't travel, let's say, get involved on campus. I was very involved at Stony Brook. You know, I was in different associations. I was in an academic sorority. I was part of the executive board of the South Asian Student Alliance. The skill sets that I got to build up at, at Stony Brook, just speaking to different you know, people, uh, working on different issues, helped me build the skills that I got to apply to my career today. Um, so I would say preparing for those moments later, whether you go to graduate school straight out of undergrad or whether you wait a couple of years. I waited a couple of years to get some work experience, um, and I really do recommend that. But I think at Stony Brook, you know, your experience is not just only in the classroom, which I think is very important, but also staying involved on campus. And again, I think finding those unique opportunities to do internships, um, fellowships, et cetera, outside of the classroom. And I really do a credit being so involved at Stony Brook to the reasons why I got to build some of those skills early on. Thanks. Um, Ambassador Gallucci, how would, what advice would you give the GLI majors of today who are mostly freshmen and how they can get involved in international relations and geopolitics? Do well. <laughs> I, I, I really do, uh, I really think that uh, I teach undergraduates in the spring semester and I teach graduate students in the fall semester. Uh, and a lot of them have come to Georgetown because they want to go into government service. So I focus on that more than any other aspect of an international affairs career. Uh, and what occurs to me is that while you're in school, I think uh, Maureen's advice is a real good one. Uh, 
do overseas study if you're interested in national affairs. The first thing an NGO wants to know is whether the person they're presuming to hire can actually survive overseas. And if you're thinking particularly of development, then don't go overseas to Europe, go overseas south of the equator. I mean, there are some things like that which uh, will, will be very helpful to you. I also think that, uh, and I'm a, a big believer in, in inter interdisciplinary study, which I know is a big part of this degree, but I'm also a believer in history <laughs> as being an extremely important thing uh, to study. And you mentioned one, uh, Dean Sampson, a minute ago, language. Uh, I mean, I, I, have, I didn't start traveling until I was in graduate school. I'd never been east of Montauk Point or west of Buffalo when I was at, at Stony Brook. But I traveled immensely you know, all over and, and worked in the Middle East and Northeast Asia and Europe. And I do not speak a foreign language. I had to qualify for two. So um, the recommendation here in response to your question is don't be like me. Uh, <laughs> I've had to overcome that handicap. I lived in Italy for four years. My father grew up in Italy. My mother spoke Italian. I can barely manage what we used to call scorta Italian. Italian you speak to your bodyguards I just, uh, who are infinitely forgiving. So I would say overseas travel, endorsed what Maureen said. I would say certainly um, learn a foreign language, learn a region particularly well, pick a region. It really doesn't matter what, it could be Africa, Latin America. Uh, right now, I think China probably is uh, leading the list for a lot of people, but uh, understand the religion, the history, the sociology uh, of a region and, and know why things happen a certain way in that region. And you'll be able to apply the understanding of independent variable and dependent variable as you go in other regions. So I think there's much about international affairs that transfers and is not specific to a particular case. Uh, and I would encourage students uh, as they are still in the university, whether graduate or undergraduate, take advantage of the time and to get that study, get the language if you can, uh, before you presume to go out into the world. Thank you. So let me turn to you, Mr. Corman, and ask, um, you know, we just heard today, maybe China's the biggest region of, of interest, but for the graduating class of 24, um, what, would you, what would you expect the biggest issues to be facing students as they start their careers? Yeah, I'd hate to echo China, but I have to echo China. And I think, you know, what you've seen with this pandemic, it's accelerated, I think, those trends that you've seen over the past few years that on the technology side, you know, certainly there have been intellectual property issues forever with China, but that's come to a head. You've seen, you know, the their ability to throw their weight around globally. I think that's accelerated with what you're seeing in Hong Kong and Taiwan and the South China Sea. So as a focus area, I think that is spot on. Um, even from a more narrow technology oriented base, which is what I deal with day to day, you're starting to really see that bifurcated world where you know, there's sort of, you're either in the US or it's allied camp uh, on the technology front or you're with China. You know, it's becoming that much of a either or equation. And in the news, you hear about TikTok and Huawei and, you know, all that, I think you're just going to keep seeing that accelerate. So if I were to focus on an area, if I were, I did recommend to my daughter that she look at, uh, she focus on China. She ended up going with the Middle East and she's learning Arabic now to the point on learning a foreign language. So, um, but it's just, I just see that really accelerating. Um, I do want to add two things though to the to the how to get into the field um, comment from that Bob and Maureen mentioned. In my anecdote on you know how I got to DC, I think the two things that stick out that I want to emphasize is really jumping into things without a plan. You know, I think I, I had that unpaid internship. It wasn't going to pay my way for very long, but just being on the ground in the area you're striving to make a career of far easier to, to meet some people and, you know, keep on top of these issues that you care about. Uh, and the second thing I'd say is the networking part. Um, I didn't have a big network, you know, growing up as a kid in, in, in New York, but my professor did. So getting to know the Bob Gallucci's of the world and asking him for tips and tricks on how do you, you know, um, how do you get close to a professor without being a pain in the butt? 
I'd love to hear what his answer is to that. <laughs> All right, before we let him answer, let me turn to Dr. Galson. <laughs> and you're, you're the lone biochemistry major in this <laughs> crowd. <laughs> Um, so how do you think the interdisciplinary nature of globalization studies that we're talking about here affects sort of the standard career options that we're used to thinking about outside of, you know, so you went from biochemistry to public health, but if you were a globalization major, how, how would that have played out and what are your thoughts there? Well, I think, as I'm sure the other panelists think, which is that the solution to the world's problems in the coming century, the, the best problem solvers are going to be those with interdisciplinary training. The, the problems that the world is facing are getting more and more complex and it's very difficult as a subspecialist, be that, be that a physician or a lawyer, it's very difficult with a very a straight laced kind of background and set of experience where you're not uh, delving into other disciplines to really see a broad enough picture of how to solve some of these challenges without the interdisciplinary work. So I see it as an absolute essential uh, to being successful in, in many fields, but certainly in international affairs. And I can't agree more with the previous speakers about the importance of foreign language. I, I, I love the irony here. I actually speak French, but I learned it by total immersion, you know, living with a family that uh, didn't speak any English for a year. That'll teach it to you. Um, and it connects me to, you know, the, the question that you're asking the others, you know, what's a tip? Strongest tip I have is take risks. There are a lot of people that don't want to go outside of their comfort zone, whether that's going to a, visiting a country that may have some uh, safety issues, whether it's, you know, trying to communicate when you actually don't know how, uh, learning something that you, you, don't, you don't think you may be capable of learning, hanging out with people that you may not have thought about to hang out with. So all of these things that involve risk-taking, for me, I hire a lot of people, I promote people. People who take risks are more successful than people who aren't. So that's, that's one thing to get comfortable with that risk. And if you really want to be interdisciplinary, that's one way to do it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in about the State Department. So let me come back to Ms. Ahmed. And you know, one of the questions is how do you sort of sort through this you, well, let me back up. You used a lot of acronyms in the beginning, right? So that sort of alphabet soup is very, I think, emblematic of how many people think about the State Department and sub-departments of sub-departments. So how do you find your way um, to figure out what's the best place for me as a student to, to start? Sure. Um, I will say I'm still trying to find my way through the State Department. I like to compare walking through the halls of the Truvid off, uh, building like it's the Harry Potter Hogwarts. You're walking in and you're going to go one way in the building and you might show up into some different area. But um, I would say that one of the greatest things about the State Department is the fact that there are multiple different avenues for students to join. And I, I see some of the comments coming in about these various fellowship programs. So I joined through the Presidential Management Fellowship, but there's a Pathways program, which is um, you know, a program that allows interns to come join the State Department, whether at the undergraduate level or at the graduate level. Um, but then you know, hopefully that turns into a more long-term um, um, employment. Um, and also there are other avenues as well, such as um, the Pickering Fellowship, the Wrangell Fellowship, uh, the pain fellowship these are great uh, fellowships that are trying to bring more diverse voices to the state department and i think that's one of the key things right now is realizing that you know as we start working on these issues around the world the the demographics are changing around the world as well you know we have a youth bulge in you know africa asia around the world and we need more diverse voices more young people to want to join this career i will admit it right now that it has been a daunting process to be 
younger um, at the State Department. You know, I was sent to our embassy in Pretoria to be an acting coordinator at a time when I was just about six months into the government. But how do I face my own imposter syndrome and say, you know, just because I'm young does not mean that I'm inexperienced. In fact, I might be closest to the issues we're working on on the ground and I can, you know, recognize that and, and use that to my advantage. So one of the things I would say is that, you know, if you want to pursue a career, whether it's the United Nations, the State Department or another entity like this, take advantage of the fact that you might have a new, more global perspective that some of us don't even have. I already see the differences between myself and my younger brother, even though we're both millennials, we have a six year difference and he sees the world entirely different. And I'm sure that the students right now who are facing what it's like to have gone through this um, college experience with COVID in the backdrop, thinking about the things that are impacting them and getting very passionate about making a difference. So I would say, you know, find different avenues talk to people. I will also say that one of the things I did during grad school, and maybe this is not the best advice, um, is, you know, my last semester of grad school, I came down from New York every week to do coffees, like six, six coffees a day, with just people I contacted through LinkedIn. I LinkedIn stopped pretty, pretty much all of DC. Um, um, Ambassador Gallucci, I'm sorry I didn't get to you back then, but I, I found all different contacts and sent a, a very short email saying, look, I'm interested in learning more for you, do you have 30 minutes for coffee? That allowed me to make more context, that allowed me to know what's happening in DC. You know, I come from New York, I knew nothing about DC. Um, and I used that to my advantage. I knew that while academics are incredibly important, it's also what you're doing outside that are critical as well. So I made sure that in grad school, I would get ahead of the curve and, and make those connections. Um, so, you know, finding those opportunities, getting an internship, doing all of that, talk to as many people as you, you can, and you'll be surprised how many people want to help you. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, let me, I'm not sure who would be the best person to answer this question. Maybe Mr. Foreman. So let me throw it out and see. Um, this is from a physics major who's interested in international affairs and would like to know where in the private industry should, uh, I look for the student for intersectionality between natural sciences and physics and international affairs. So what are the private industries where that would be a good um, place to head? Yeah, consulting is not a bad one. Um, so my firm, while we do hire a fair share of international relations back, you know, people with international relations backgrounds, you know, what we really look for are kind of skill sets over, you know, the, the exact major that, uh, folks studied in school, but there are a lot of uh, engineers, for example, that work at our firm. And the reason why is some of the business problems companies have, have a sort of focus on technology. And so we did some work for a, I'll give an example of um, a company that developed an underwater robot to, to uh, track pipelines and look at pipeline integrity to make sure oil and gas flows properly and they don't damage the environment, this and that. Well, having an engineer on the team was extremely valuable to think through, you know, what are the problems that, um, that this technology could encounter? What are the adjacent markets that, that this technology was applicable for? So in that case, um, you know, leveraging the skill set of engineers is something that we, we do constantly. And having smart, you know, multidisciplinary individuals is a plus, I think, rather than just being really stovepiped in one narrow area. Um, but there's any number of like the types of firms that I've seen in DC that hire kind of folks with that background, IR and technology and uh, rather engineering of physical sciences. There's quite a few, you know, there's some think tanks, um, Union of Concerned Scientists and organizations that, that follow nuclear weapons and systems. I think having an engineering background or, uh, you know, more of a technology bent certainly helps. Thanks. And since this is the College of Arts and Sciences, I'm just going to, for the students, say physics is just as good, if not good, better than being an engineer, right? So I know the physicists would say so, at least. Uh, um, let me uh, ask this of Dr. Galston. This is a, a little bit of a specific question about in the medical product development world that you mentioned earlier. You know, how... How do you get into the policy and guidelines for international supply chains? Um, and, you know, there's intellectual property. We've heard a lot about China and intellectual property. So 
what what would the guidance you would give? Would, what guidance would you give um, to get into that field in that area? Yeah, people in that area that I'm not really an expert in myself too much, but they usually have some sort of science or education uh, engineering background. But there are you know also specific training programs in that. But every big medical product company has supply chain uh, functions because you have to get the, um, the, the products all around the world. So I think the best thing to do is to look at specific jobs and see what the requirements are and you know, try to meet them. I, I'm not an expert in that, but I'm happy to try to get some information for anyone who wants to know about it in particular. In terms of policy making, I mean, a lot of the policy is made uh, at international organizations like WHO or FDA. You know, when I was at FDA, we put the policies in place to allow the PEPFAR program that Maureen is, is working in. That was terrifically exciting and has saved the lives of millions of people. It's an amazing example of private industry and the public sector working together to get HIV uh, drugs to people in uh, countries that can't afford U.S drug prices. So there are lots of different ways, uh, but that's that's a start. Thanks, that was uh, a great lead in. I, if oh, I can interrupt, ahead. I'll also add that I know the federal government is hiring a lot of, not quite logistics or supply chain analysts, but hiring individuals to help them think through vulnerabilities. You know, after the pandemic, um, I think the vulnerability of supply chains to disruption is real. Uh, the Pentagon, for example, they're looking at um, essentially what they call it's adversarial capitalism, which it means as they look to engage commercial type companies in the defense supply chain, how do they ensure that those commercial companies aren't quietly being funded by Russian firms or Chinese firms or others that they view as you know, inimical to US interests? So there's, uh, I think the federal government is a, a good source for those kinds of jobs today. Thanks. And then I was just going to turn to uh, Maureen, uh, Ms. Ahmed, and ask about the supply chain, particularly given your experiences in South Africa. I'm glad Dr. Galton raised what PEPFAR accomplished. Um, maybe you, you could just speak to that a little bit. I'm not sure all the students on here know exactly what happened there. It might have been almost before some of them were born. I don't know. Um, but if you could just give us a little bit of background on that, it would be great. Yeah, sure. So, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, so, the PEPFAR program, which works on HIV uh, around the world, uh, we work in collaboration, again, with what our colleagues have said here, uh, with the private sector, with multilateral organizations, to bring um, HIV treatment services and prevention services to countries on the ground. So, in, in the South African context, we work with a lot of different stakeholders, uh, the multilateral organization called the Global Fund for HIV, Tuberculosis, and Malaria helps to work with us along with the partnerships that we have with our bilateral counterparts uh, to bring free HIV treatment services and um, drugs to the ground. So our services, uh, particularly for the U.S. government, we complement that, that, that work that's being done by providing uh, resources for the healthcare workers on the ground. So we provide uh, funds to uh, fund community health workers, uh, physicians, and doctors to provide those services. And one thing I've been able to be fortunate enough to see in South Africa is that our, our services on the ground have a tangible effect because we are getting to count uh, how many people are taking their drugs, who has fallen off those drugs, and being able to follow that through uh, to ensure that we can provide retention services if they fall off their drugs, um, and then as well as lo uh, loss of care. So, Currently, for COVID, uh, we've seen you know a, a dramatic shift in, in how many people are coming to clinics and um, who is not coming back to the clinics for their services. So we, we're working with our partners to ensure that patients on the ground have their HIV treatment uh, services and their drugs for an extended month of time. We call that multi-month dispensing. So we worked with the government of South Africa to ensure that patients who want their drugs can get those supplies for three months, for six months. And we see how critical that is, especially right now, because if we want patients to continue to use their uh, drugs, 
um, we need to provide them with a multi-month uh, dispensing. Um, so we've been pushing that on the policy side. We made that absolutely a critical standpoint for our, our resources. And we're seeing that uh, across the African continent and other countries where we provide PEPFAR services. So I think COVID uh, definitely pushed that policy uh, forward and in, in ensuring that we are making an impact there. Thanks. And if I could just editorialize for the GLI program, um, you know, maybe there are some lessons learned in PEPFAR to address some of the current China intellectual property concerns that we've heard about that would be good research projects uh, for our students for the future, because I think that really was a, a key piece of getting those drugs into sub-Saharan Africa, was working with the pharmaceutical companies and the pricing involved in manufacturing those drugs. Um, that, that was a big policy achievement. Um, let me look through my questions. They're coming in so fast. Um, I have a question asking, uh, and I'll open this up for anyone to answer. Is it useful to have a major or minor in computer science along with international relations? So feelings about that. Somebody feel strongly if you want to jump in. And I'll say, I think cybersecurity has a heavy, obvious computer science dimension. And so uh, it's a narrower field, and it, but it certainly has international relations implications. I would think that's a natural for uh, a computer science major or minor. Right, and I think the cybersecurity issues, um, just to follow on to that, are going to become even greater as we develop our quantum information networking and uh, information transfer because there are a lot of implications there for cybersecurity and, and decoding and transfer of information. So I think it's um, not just computer science, but also that application of a new technology. Um, would somebody like to speak about um, how this uh, major might or might not work well in combination with sustainability? and sustainability, we actually have a degree in sustainability studies. Um, you know, what's your sense of how those might go together? And again, I'll open it up to anyone who wants to take a stab at that. You know, I think it's hard to be, a, be very, very strict about what backgrounds people should or shouldn't have. Uh, look at those of us on the call. There's an enormous variety of ways that you can contribute in international affairs, in public health, internationally, global issues with many, many different backgrounds. So as long as there's a hook from what you're studying into some aspect, I think you're okay. I mean, something like, you know, if you really want to go into public health, then health background is pretty critical. You're not going to be a computer science background for that, but that's, that's pretty obvious. Otherwise, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, Ambassador Gallucci, you were going to leap in there and got beaten to the punch. Did you want to add something? Um, I was actually going to pile on to uh, Steve Galson's comment earlier about uh, interdisciplinary study, which he just in, enhanced a moment ago. It, it occurred to me that at one point I was an assistant secretary of state for political military affairs for years, a couple of years. Nobody in my recollection ever came into my office and said we have a terrible problem in history in the Middle East or a terrible problem in political science in Northeast Asia. People don't talk that way in the real world. The last time you hear that is when you're an undergraduate and you haven't gone into disciplinary, everything's in disciplines. And the question is, how useful is that? And I think everybody here is pretty much saying uh, the integration of this is something you do on the fly uh, eventually. But if you can begin it as an undergraduate, or at least as a graduate student, you're way ahead. I mean, problems are complex. And uh, as I'm sure, uh, well, I, I will defer to him, but I'm, I'm assuming Jay would say, that you put a team together for a, an issue that cuts across disciplines. You might need an engineer, but you might also need someone who speaks a foreign language and you might, you might need a bunch of things. 
And I think if you can begin to prepare yourself for the real world while you're in, at a university, and this is what Stony Brook is doing now, is, is helping you uh, with structures uh, so you don't have to do that all on your own. And I think that's all to the good. Thank you. Um, let me um, just follow up uh, and with a question that came in from one of the GLI majors. How do you think the current state of world politics will affect our students' education? I know we've talked about the world politics in other ways, um, but how do you think it will affect education? Will it, let me ask, will it affect education um, where we are with our uh, world politics at the moment? Um, who are you asking that question of? Oh, I'll ask it of you, because you unmuted, so you're in the hot seat now. <laughs> um, it occurs to me that um, over a period of, if you have worked as long as I have in international affairs, really over 50 years, that there are periods in which um, America's instinct is interventionist. And uh, we tend tended at various times to involve ourselves in the internal politics of other countries, sometimes with the use of force. And there are other times when uh, a more isolationist instinct takes over and we wanna pull back. It's not on, I mean, this is, cyclical, of course, and when the first uh, is manifest uh, by putting uh, young men and women in, in harm's way, then you eventually come to the point when people are pretty enthusiastic about not, to, not doing that quite so easily. So when I look at the situation now, and I, so one of the things is what kind of posture is the American mind in right now? whether we are talking about a second term for the current president or a new president coming into office, what is he going to find? And it will be a he here. So what is he going to find in terms of what the, what were the American mind is and the American polity is really interested in and wants of its government? Uh, I think that will be very important for what kinds of activities are gonna be emphasized uh, that's, that's one way of looking at it. I also think that uh, right now the, uh, the president has thematically over uh, his four years in office stated an America first program, uh, which has been interpreted in various ways what that exactly means and whether that means pulling back from internationalism, whether it's pulling back from globalization, from international trade and that sort of thing, not clear it seems to me anyway. But I think trying to figure that out and then trying to fee figure out what the national political reaction is to that would be very important if I were now trying to decide what kind of future I wanted for myself in international affairs. Thank you. So we've got three people here who've um, worked as public servants, I would say, in the, in the government or the State Department. How does one navigate that world? I think one of the things that you learn, I've learned is right, the public servants are the ones making everything happen policy-wise, regardless of you know, what political party is in power. There's, there's a large government um, that's working forward all the time for the benefit of the people. And so what's your advice to navigate those very um, alternating cyclical politics that you just alluded to? Um, as you work at the public domain. You, words of wisdom on that. Well, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the vast, vast majority of people who work, even in policy roles in the government, are not either not political appointees or they don't even report to political appointees. So an enormous amount of very, very important work goes on regardless of factors that you may think make it impossible. It, it is very, very challenging for people like uh, Bob and I who have worked very closely uh, with people in the political sphere. There's some special challenges, but for people starting out, I don't really think you have to worry about that much. Uh, you, 
go into a starting kind of job and you work your way up or work your way across to do do something else and um, the challenges are enormous no matter what's going on. Thank you. Um, so let me uh, just, we're coming up close to 90 minutes, so I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, give you each an opportunity for last words of advice. I asked a couple of you for one piece of advice, but now we've had a little bit of time to reflect. Are there some words you'd like to leave with our students and whoever would like to go first? Ambassador Gallucci. It always occurs to me that uh, when I'm talking to students, and I assume there are some students out in this, this audience, that we could talk about your professional life, which is largely what we've been doing. And so I should tell you that uh, you get versions of this sentence, focus on what's important in your professional life. Uh, don't sweat the small stuff, they sometimes say. I think that's good advice. Look at the mission. Look what's really important. Don't worry about stuff that's less important. Keep your eye on the ball, blah, blah, et cetera. Howsomever, uh, and I say this particularly if you're interested in government service, and in particular if you end up in Washington, D.C., uh, the important stuff turns out not to be entirely located in your career. The important stuff turns out to be your family first and then your community and friends. And so this is a plea uh, beginning when you are an undergraduate and you're focused on your studies or certainly a graduate student when you're even more focused on your studies, you remember to maintain friendships. And then when you have family, I know you start with a family, but sometimes that family gets bigger. Uh, Putting them in the picture as part of the important stuff uh, turns out to be sometimes uh, something you have to concentrate on and do. That the draws of one's career can bring you away from some important stuff that would be the family. So it is just a reminder that the community, um, the family, uh, the friends, that they all count uh, as well as the next career step you might be planning. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ahmed. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to echo what Ambassador Belucci is saying. You know, as someone in the age of social media, I think our generation is just inundated with how successful everyone is around us. And it's daunting, right? Like, I know I'm part of that problem. I know that I constantly put pressure on myself to do as much as possible, as quick as possible without taking a breather. In fact, I think this is the first year where I took a breather and realized, my gosh, I've been on flights nonstop for the last five years, and I didn't even take a chance to figure out what is truly important to me as a person. Um, that level of burnout, I think, is detrimental to some regard. Of course, it's driven us to be ambitious and, and doing great things, but I think one thing we might lose touch of is realizing that outside noise and the success noise that we consistently hear of that's not the only way to be successful. I, I will like to, you know, say the same thing that one of the biggest successes I had at Stony Brook is walking away with like five best friends who I take trips with all the time and are my support circle that will be there all the time. I mean, when I went to embassies overseas, they came to visit me and that was my home away from home when I had moments where I felt alone starting over making new friends. So I would say, you know, take a breather, realize that the only success that matters is to yourself. and. Uh, understanding what you want to do is not just going to be on paper. It's going to be these like little milestones that you have. So I myself am going through that journey of how to uh, redefine success um, and, and also realizing that uh, there are different ways to measure that. So I would just say, enjoy this experience. Also, there are plenty of things that I did at Stony Brook that didn't lead to my career, but are such treasured memories. So I think as, as much as I said before, stay involved, get involved, do internships, I also want to say and contradict that and, and say, you know, enjoy yourself. Uh, go to the parties responsibly, but, uh, uh, you know, get to know your friends, go study abroad, do some of those more experience-related um, experiences so that you can create your own um, definition of success. And, and uh, let's not worry so much about being part of this dynamic of, you know, constantly sitting pressured 
to do everything and anything that's around us um, is my one piece of advice. Thank you. Mr. Corman, Dr. Galton, last words of advice? Uh, I think what was said was excellent. Um, you know, I see that at my firm as well. We tend to hire kind of classes of incoming analysts. So between 10 and 15 um, young analysts per year. And I'm talking to Hodan about uh, institutionalizing something between Avocent and Stony Brook. So maybe you'll look for announcements in the future on that. But, um, but that dynamic I see just at a more local level where this group comes in and you know, they're so focused on how their peers are doing. And because they're in one class, it's easy to say six months from, from now, you know, that person got a promotion and I didn't. And, and it, it just preoccupies these young people. And they're, you know, my recommendation is to just focus on yourself and your career, uh, but not look at, you know, what these others are doing in that same time frame because that is a major distraction. Um, the only other thing I'd say is when I think about you know, what really makes somebody successful at Avicen? Uh, we talked a lot about specific, um, about specific majors and minors and combinations, but I think uh, to, to Ambassador Gallucci's point, you know, what we look for is problem solvers. And I tend to just react far more easily better with somebody who comes to me, not with a problem and says, help me solve, you know, I have, I've come across a couple of obstacles in my research path and you know, I don't know how to get beyond that. They'll, they'll ask me for advice. I'd far prefer somebody to come to me and say, I've hit these obstacles, but here's three things that I think we can do to, to overcome those. That kind of dynamism is something that I look for um, in, a, in, in an analyst, and those are kind of the people that tend to take off at the firm. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, I cannot disagree with anything that any of the th previous three panelists have mentioned, and I, I particularly think the point about family is is incredibly important and salient. Um, I think what I could add to this is a couple uh, of words about passion. Um, the people that I work with who are most successful and happy are the ones that feel passionately about what they're doing. Uh, I think. Uh, over a long career, you deserve to do something that you feel really passionate about. Um, I look at people and have seen people at many stages of their careers, no matter what they're doing, and a lot of them are not happy. Uh, at some point, they took a wrong road or they accepted a compromise. So if you find something you're really interested in, don't stop until you can get there. And then if you end up somewhere which might be a dead end or that you realize you don't actually like, don't stay doing it, find something else. So continue to seek uh, satisfaction and passion and you'll have a great career. Thanks. Thank you. I want to thank all of you. I'm inspired. I want to be a student again, um, hearing all these great possibilities in front of us. And I want to thank all of the students who submitted their questions. There's far too many to name here today. Um, they've been scrolling in. I know we didn't quite hit all of the questions. Some of them were pretty specific. Um, so if you still have time, I'm not sure how Janet's going to make this work, but she's going to do some wondrous stuff with Zoom. Stay on the call and we'll let you mingle with our panelists. Um, uh, so more on that. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for participating today. And for those of you who aren't staying on, please stay engaged with the Institute for Globalization Studies. Um, there are events planned in the future. And the next one is October 7th at 3 p.m. when we'll be welcoming NYU's Julie Livington for a talk on self-devouring growth and the con about the common assumption that economic growth is a necessary basis of well-being. And I want Sophie to give a wave because she wasn't on is a video at the very beginning. This is the director of our institute and the director of the GLI program. Enjoy the rest of the beautiful day and thank you everyone again for sharing so much of your careers and your experiences. And um, I look forward to just chatting with you in a few minutes.